This is part six of James P. Cannon's History of American Trotskyism. So chapter six, the break with the common turn. We have now had five lectures in this course. With the fifth one last week, as you will remember, we covered the first four years of the left opposition, the Communist League of America, 1928 to 1932. These were the times, as I remarked last week, of the severest isolation and the greatest hardship for the new movement. Last week, I emphasized, perhaps overemphasized, the negative sides of the movement in that period, the stagnation, the poverty of forces and material means, the inevitable internal difficulties accruing from such a set of circumstances, and the lunatic fringe which plagued us as it plagues every new radical movement. This isolation together with, together with its attendant evils was imposed upon us by objective factors beyond our control. We could not prevent it, not with the best efforts, the best will. It was the condition of the times. The most important of these factors making our isolation so almost absolute was the upsurge of the Stalinist movement which re resulted from the crisis in all the bourgeois countries at the same time that the Soviet Union was bounding forward under the first five-year plan of industrialization. The enhanced prestige of the USSR and of Stalinism, which appeared to be its legitimate representative in the eyes of uncritical people, and the great masses are uncritical, made our oppositionist movement appear somewhat bizarre, unrealistic. Besides that, there was great stagnation in the general labor movement. There were no strikes. The workers were, were quiescent. They were not interested in any theoretical questions. They were not even interested in any actions at that time. All this acted against our small group and pushed it into a corner. Our task in that difficult time was to hold on, to clarify the great, the great questions, to educate our caters in preparation for the future when objective conditions would open up possibilities for an expansion of the movement. Our task also was to test out to the very end the possibilities of reforming the communist parties and the communist international, reforming the communist parties and the communist international, which up to that time had embraced practically the whole workers' vanguard in this country and throughout the world. The events which began to break over the world in the early part of 1933 showed that we had succeeded magnificently in our main task. When things began to move, when the opportunity came to break out of our isolation, we were ready. We lost no time in grasping the opportunities presented to us beginning in 1933 and especially in 1934. Our movement had been educated in a great school under the direction and inspiration of Comrade Trotsky, the School of Internationalism. Our cadres had been forged together in the heat of study and dispute over the greatest world questions. The great weakness of the American communist movement in the past, as I have mentioned in previous lectures, was its national mindedness, not in theory, but in practice its ignorance of international events and unconcern about them, its lack of real instruction and of serious interest in theory. These faults were corrected in our young movement. We educated a group of people who proceeded in all questions from fundamental considerations of theory, from international experience, and learned how to analyze international events. The mysteries of the Russian problem were solved by our movement in article after article, pamphlet after pamphlet, and book after book, Comrade Trotsky opened up for us a worldview on all questions. He gave us a clear understanding of the complexities of a worker's state in a capitalist encirclement, a worker's state de degenerating and throwing up a retrograde bureaucracy, but still retaining its basic foundations. Germany was already then becoming the center of the world problem. Trotsky, as far back as 1931, wrote a pamphlet which he called Germany, the key to the international situation. Before all others, he perceived the menacing growth of fascism and the inevitability of a fundamental showdown between fascism and communism. 
before anyone else and clearer than anyone else, he analyzed what was coming in Germany. He educated us to an understanding of it and tried to prepare the German Communist Party and the German workers for that fatal test. The Spanish Revolution, which broke out in December 1930, was also studied and comprehended by our young movement. First of all, with the assistance of the theoretical writings and interpretations of Comrade Trotsky. We took time in those days of isolation to study the Chinese question. I mentioned last week that during this difficult period, our movement, despite all its poverty and weakness, managed to publish a full-sized book, Problems of the Chinese Revolution. This book contained suppressed theses, articles, and expositions of the Russian opposition written in the decisive days of the Chinese Revolution, 1925, 1926, and 1927. That great world historical battle had unfolded, you may say, behind the backs of the blindfolded members of the Comintern, who had never been permitted to learn what the great masters of Marxism in the Russian left opposition had to say about these events. We published the suppressed documents. Our comrades were educated on the problems of the Chinese revolution. That is one of the important reasons. In fact, it is the important reason why our party has such a clear and firm stand on the colonial question today. Why we do not lose our heads over the defense of China and the struggle of India, of India for independence. The significance that this great uprising of the Asiatic peoples can have for the international proletarian revolution is clearly understood by our party. That is part of its heritage from those days of isolation and study. In the early part of 1933, we began to intervene more actively in the general labor movement. After long propagandistic preparation, we started our turn towards mass work. I have already told you about the fight we had in our organization with some impatient people who wanted to begin with mass work, jump over our own heads, so to speak, leaving for the future the education of our cater, the definition of our program and our propagandistic work. That was turning things upside down. We worked out our program, formed our cater, did our preliminary propagandistic work first. Then when opportunities arose for activity in the labor movement, we were ready to put our activity to some purpose. We did not engage in activity merely for the sake of activity, which some wit once described as all motion and no direction. We were prepared to enter the mass movement with a clearly defined program and with methods calculated to bring the maximum results to the revolutionary movement from the minimum amount of required activity. In reading the bound volumes of The Militant, which contain a chronological record of our activities and plans and hopes, it is reported that on January 22, 1933, there was an unemployed conference in New York. It had been called, of course, on the initiative of the Stalinist organization, but it was a little different from some of their previous conferences from which we had been excluded. This time in their waverings and wanderings from right to left, they started dabbling with the United Front, trying to interest some non-Stalinist organizations in a general unemployment movement. To that end, they issued a call inviting all organizations to the conference. We commented in our paper that this was a turn in the right direction toward the United Front, at least a half turn. I wrote an article which pointed out that by inviting all organizations, they had finally opened up a small crack through which the left opposition might enter that movement. We would make our way through that crack and open it wider. We showed up at that conference, Schachtman and Cannon big as life, prepared to tell the entire proletariat how the struggle against unemployment should be carried out. And it was no joke either. Our program was the correct one and we explained it at length. The militant carried a full report of our speeches advocating a united front of the political parties and the trade unions for unemployment relief. On January 29, 1933, there was held at Gillespie, Illinois, a conference of the Progressive Miners Union and other independent labor organizations to consider the question of a new labor federation. I attended the conference by invitation from a group of the progressive miners and spoke there. 
This was the first time in nearly five years that I'd been able to get out of New York. It was also the first time that any representative of the American left opposition had a chance to speak to workers as such outside the small circle of in it was also the first time that any representative of the American left opposition had a chance to speak to workers as such outside the small circle of intellectual radicals. We seized the opportunity. I was sent out there by our league, spent a few days with the miners and made some important contacts. It felt very good to be once again in touch with the living movement of the workers, the mass movement. Coming back on the bus from Gillespie to Chicago, I recall it very distinctly. I read newspaper accounts of the appointment of Hitler as chancellor by President Hindenburg. I had the feeling then at that moment that things were beginning to break. The stagnation, the stalemate in the world labor movement was breaking wide open. Things were moving to a showdown. We were fully ready to take our part in the new situation. As I checked the reports the other day, preparing my notes for this lecture, it seemed to me that this action of our league, our reaching out for the first time to participate in a workers' mass meeting in Gillespie, Illinois, was symbolic of our attunement to the new period. Our action was unconsciously synchronized with the breakup of the stalemate in Germany. We reacted very energetically to this new development, to the beginnings of new stirrings in the labor movement here, and especially the situation in Germany. We were like athletes, trained and poised for action, but restrained by external difficulties and unable to move forward. Then suddenly a new situation opened up and we leaped into it. Our first reaction to the German events was to call a mass meeting in New York. For a long time, we'd abandoned the idea of mass meetings because the masses wouldn't come. The best we could do was to hold small open forums, lectures, circle gatherings, etc. This time we essayed a mass meeting, Stuyvesant Casino, February 5, 1933. The meaning of the German events with Schachtman and Cannon as speakers. The report in the militant said that 500 people turned out to our mass meeting. We sounded the alarm on the impending showdown between fascism and communism in Germany. Then, while the issues were so acute, every day in Germany witnessing new developments, we did an absolutely unprecedented thing for a group so small as ours. We transformed our weekly militant, by that time it had become a weekly, and brought it out three times a week, each issue blazing away with the message of Trotskyism on the events in Germany. If you should ask me how we did it, I wouldn't be able to explain, but we did it. It wasn't possible but there is a saying among Trotskyists that in times of crisis, you do not do what is possible, but what is necessary. And we thought it necessary to break out of our routine discussions and criticisms of the Stalinists to do something to shock the whole workers' movement into realizing how fateful for the whole world were the happenings in Germany. We wanted to call all workers and especially the communist workers to attention. We speeded up the tempo. We began to shout, to shout the alarm. Our comrades ran to every meeting they could find, to every slightest gathering of workers with bundles of the militant under their arms, shouting at the top of their voices, read the militant, read the truth about Germany, read what Trotsky says. Our slogan during the German events was the united front of the workers organizations and battle to the death. The united fighting front of all workers organizations against fascism. The Stalinists and the Social Democrats rejected the United Front in Germany. They both pretend otherwise after the events, seeking to, seeking to blame each other, but they are both liars, both guilty of betrayal. They divided the workers and neither of them had any will to fight. Through that division, the monstrous plague of fascism came to power in Germany and threw its dark shadow over the whole world. We did everything we could to awaken, arouse, and educate the American communist workers in those fateful weeks. We held a series of mass meetings, not only the one I have mentioned. We had a series in Manhattan, and for the first time, we branched out into the boroughs. They had so surrounded and so isolated us that we had never been able to get out of 14th Street in the early days. We had only one branch, 
because we didn't have enough people to divide up. Everything was concentrated around this little area of 14th Street and Union Square where radical workers congregate. But in this crisis of Germany, we branched out and held meetings in Brooklyn and in the Bronx. All over the country, the militant reports, mass meetings were held by the local branches of the Communist League of America. Hugo Erler, at that time a member of our organization, was sent on tour to speak about Germany. We were extremely aggressive in our approach to the Stalinists. We were determined at all costs to get our message to those willing to listen. We even invaded a Stalinist mass meeting in the Bronx, turning the tables on them. Schachtman and I, flanked by a few of our comrades, just walked into this Stalinist mass meeting and asked for the floor. The audacity of the demand seemed to nonplus the fakers in charge and there were demands from the floor. Let him speak. We spoke and gave our message to the Stalinist meeting. With new life beginning to stir in the general labor movement, we neglected no opportunity to take part in the new activities. In March, 1933, a statewide unemployment conference was sponsored by the Stalinists in Albany with about 500 delegates. Is it Albany or Albany? The same regulations which enabled us to appear at the local conference in New York also enabled us to send delegates to Albany. I appeared at the conference, took the floor and made a speech to the 500 delegates on the Marxist conception of the United Front in the unemployed movement. That speech is printed in the militant of May 10, 1933. National and international issues were coordinated. At the same time that we were shouting at the top of our voices about Germany, we took time to participate in a conference on unemployment in the state of New York. You know that the advice, the explanations, the warnings of Trotsky went unheeded. The German Communist Party, under the direct leadership and control of Stalin and his gang in Moscow, capitulated in Germany without a struggle. Fascism triumphed without even the semblance of a civil war, without even a scuffle in the street. And that, as Trotsky has explained many times, and Engels before him, is the worst and most demoralizing of all defeats, the defeat without battle, because those who are so defeated lose confidence in themselves for a long time. A party which fights may be vanquished by superior forces. Nevertheless, it leaves behind a tradition, a moral inspiration, which can be a tremendous factor in galvanizing the proletariat to rise again later at a more favorable juncture. Such a role was played in history by the Paris Commune. The international socialist movement was raised on its glorious memory. The 1905 revolution in Russia was inspired by the heroic struggle of the Paris Communards of 1871. Similarly, the revolution of 1905 in Russia, which was defeated after a battle, became the great moral capital of the Russian proletariat and was a tremendous influence in unleashing the proletarian revolution, which triumphed in 1917. The Bolsheviks always spoke of 1905 as the dress rehearsal for 1917. But what role in history can play the miserable capitulation of the social Democrats and Stalinists in Germany? Here was the most powerful proletariat in Western Europe. The Social Democrats and Stalinists combined had polled more than 12 million votes in the last election. Had the German workers been united in action, they could have scattered the fascist riffraff to the four winds with one solid blow. This powerful proletariat, disunited and betrayed by the leadership, was conquered without a fight. The most horrible, barbarous regime was imposed upon them by the fascists. Before the event, Trotsky said that a failure to fight would be the worst betrayal in history. So it was. Ten unsuccessful insurrections, said Trotsky, could not demoralize the proletariat one hundredth part as much as one capitulation without a fight, which would deprive them of confidence in themselves. After this capitulation, this tragic culmination of the German situation, Many people began to think of everything that Trotsky had said and done in the effort to aid the workers to avoid the catastrophe. 
What finally happened began to appear to many people as complete verification, if even in a negative sense, of all that he had said and explained. The prestige and authority of Trotsky and the Trotskyist movement began to grow enormously, even among those circles which had been inclined to dismiss us as sectarians and hair splitters. In the Communist Party, however, here as in other countries, in the Comintern as a whole, there was no deep reaction. It became clear then that these parties had become so bureaucratized, so corrupted from within, so demoralized, that even the cruelest betrayal in history was not capable of producing a real uprising in the ranks. It became clear that the Communist International was dead to the revolution, had been destroyed by Stalinism. And then in the unfolding dialectic of history, a peculiar contradictory development began to manifest itself. In 1914 to 1918, the international social democracy betrayed the proletariat in support of the imperialist war. The social democratic parties renounced internationalism and put themselves at the service of their own bourgeoisie. It was this betrayal which prompted the revolutionary Marxists to form the new international, the Communist International in 1919. The Communist International arose in struggle against the traitors with the program of Marxism regenerated as its banner and Lenin and Trotsky as its leaders. But in the course of events from 1919 to 1933, a brief 14 years, that very international had been converted into its polar opposite. It had become the greatest obstacle and greatest retarding factor in the international labor movement. The Communist International of St the Communist International of Stalin betrayed the proletariat even more shamefully, more ingloriously than had the Second International of the Social Democrats in 1914. Revolutionary workers of the new generation were repelled by Stalinism. In the further course of development under the terrific pressure of these international events, and particularly the rise of fascism in Germany, the social democratic parties began to disclose leftist and centrist tendencies of all kinds. There were, there were many reasons for this phenomenon. The communist parties were so walled off by the bureaucracy from any independent thought or revolutionary life that the radical workers were repelled from them. In search of revolutionary expression, many of them found their way into the more loosely constructed parties of social democracy. Also, the younger generation of social democrats who didn't have on their shoulders the blame for the betrayals of 14 years ago and who were not part of this tradition or mentality were, gro were growing restless under the terrific pressure of events and searching for a radical solution. Left-wing groupings likewise began to develop inside the social democrats, particularly in the youth organisations. And that world trend was also reflected in the United States in an upsurge of the Socialist Party. The split of 1919 and a secondary split of 1921 had left the Socialist Party in America in shambles. Nothing remains but an empty hulk. The rebel youth, everything vital and alive, poured into the young communist organization. The Socialist Party languished for years with a few thousand members, mainly supported by the traitorous gang of the Jewish Daily Forward and the labor skates of the garment unions in New York who needed the Socialist Party as a pseudo radical covering and protection against their left wing workers. The Socialist Party for years was just an ugly caricature of a party. But as the Communist Party became more and more bureaucratized, as it expelled more and more honest workers and closed the door to others, the Socialist Party began to experience a revival. Its loose and democratic structure attracted a whole new stratum of workers who'd never before been in a political movement. Thousands of them, awakened, by, awakened to radicalism by the economic crisis, streamed into the Socialist Party. It experienced an upsurge in growth in membership. By 1933, not less than 25,000 members were enrolled in its ranks. Also, as a result of this new blood and the development of the young generation, the party began to show a little vigor 
a leftist centrist tendency took shape in the ranks. Similarly, here as in other countries, there was also the development outside the Communist Party of independent groupings of workers who had hitherto not been connected with radical parties, but were awakened to radicalism as a result of their own experiences. Such a unique movement in this country was the Conference for Progressive Labour Action. It was led by A.J. Must. The CPLA started as a progressive movement in the trade unions. Under the impact of the crisis, it turned more and more in a radical direction. By the end of 1933, the Must movement was busily discussing the problem of transforming itself from a loose grouping of activists in the trade unions into a political party. Upon the capitulation of the Comintern in Germany, Trotsky gave the signal to the revolutionary Marxists of the world. The Comintern is bankrupt. We must have new parties and a new international. The long experiment, the long years of effort as a faction to influence the Communist Party, even though expelled from it, had run their course. It was not any decree of ours that made the Communist Party beyond reform. It was the demonstration of history itself. We simply recognized reality. On that basis, we changed our strategy and tactics completely. From a faction of the Communist International, we announced ourselves as the heralds of a new party and a new international. We began to appeal directly to the workers awakening to radicalism and without political affiliation or, or experience. Through long years of effort, by maintaining our position as a faction of the common turn, we had recruited from the ranks of the communist vanguard, the precious cadres of the new movement. Now we began to turn our attention to the socialist parties and independent groups and to the left and centrist groups within them. In that period, the militant printed numerous reports and analyses of the development of the left wing in the Socialist Party. There were articles about the Conference for Progressive Labour Action and its plan to transform itself into a political party. There were sympathetic approaches to the Young People's Socialist League. And as we did it here, following the line of Trotsky, it was done on an international scale. Groups of Trotskyists everywhere began to establish contacts with the newly developed and apparently viable left wing in the social democracy. The time had come to transform our whole activity to make, the time had come to transform our whole activity to make the turn to mass work. Just as in our first days, we had rejected the premature demand that we, with our little handful of people, drop everything and jump into the mass movement. So now toward the end of 1933, having completed our preliminary work and prepared ourselves, we adopted the slogan, turn from a propaganda circle to mass work. That, propose, that proposal precipitated a new international crisis. The turn brought the issue of sectarianism into the open. It had to be fought out to the end. Politics is the art of making the right move at the right time. The impatience of some people to escape isolation imposed by objective circumstances had caused a crisis and internal conflict in the early days of our organization. Now the situation was reversed. The objective conditions had radically changed. The opportunity presented itself for us to enter into the mass movement, to establish contact with workers, to penetrate deeply into the fermenting left socialist and independent movements. It was necessary to seize the opportunity without delay. Our decision to do so met determined resistance from comrades who had adapted themselves to isolation and grown comfortable in it. In that atmosphere, some people had developed a sectarian mentality. The attempt to propel the Trotskyist movement out of its isolation into the cold and turbulent waters of the mass movement caused shivers to run up and down their spines. These shivers were rationalized into principles. That marked the beginning of the fight against sectarianism in our organization, a fight which was carried through to the end in classic form. We began to recruit faster. We attracted greater attention with our propaganda on the German events. People began to come to us unexpectedly 
unknown people to obtain our literature. What does Trotsky say? What did he write about Germany? We passed a great milestone. Toward the end of our first five years of struggle, we had built up the New York branch to a total of 50 people. I remember this because a rule in the constitution of our organization limited the size of branches to 50 members. A branch reaching that size was required to be divided into two branches. We wrote this into the constitution at our first conference in 1929. We could have put the whole national membership into two branches in those days, but we were looking forward to the day when our ship would come in. I remember the question arose in 1933 for the first time of complying with the constitution on this point, and we had a dispute as to how the branch should be divided. On May 1 and 2, 1933, the Great National Mooney Congress was held in Chicago, initiated by the Stalinists, but with many trade unions participating. We sent a delegation to this Congress and I had the opportunity to speak to several thousand people. It was a refreshing experience after the long confinement in the, restric in the restricted circle of internal debate. There I entered into the beginnings of political collaboration with Albert Goldman, who was still in the Communist Party, but on the way to breaking with their line. With their line. Both his speech at the Mooney Congress and mine on the United Front were direct attacks on Stalinist policy. This prepared the ground for Goldman's expulsion and his later affiliation with us. That was the start of an extremely fruitful collaboration. From Chicago, the militant reports, I went on tour speaking on two subjects, the tragedy of the German proletariat and America's road to revolution. A group of Stalinist intellectuals in New York who had either belonged to the party or worked in its periphery began chafing under the manifest falsity of the Stalinist line as revealed by the German events. Eventually, they broke with the CP and came over to us. This was our first acquisition in bulk. Up to then, people had been joining us one by one. Now a group joined us, a group of now a group joined us, a group of intellectuals. That was significant. The movements of the intellectuals must be studied very attentively as symptoms. They move a little faster in the realm of ideas than the workers. Like the leaves at the top of a tree, they shake first. When we saw a group of rather serious intellectuals in New York breaking with Stalinism, we had to realize that this was the beginning of a movement that would soon be manifested in the ranks and that more Stalinist workers would be coming to us. An important development in the last months of 1933 was the action taken by the Conference for Progressive Labor Action. Under the impulse of growing radicalization in the ranks of the workers whom they had recruited and sensing no doubt that the Communist Party was becoming less attractive to the radical workers, the CPLA held a conference in Pittsburgh and tentatively announced the formation of a new political party. Tentative, tentatively, that is, it elected a provisional committee charged with the task of organizing the American Workers' Party. The split of Benjamin Gitlow and his little group from the Lovestoneites occurred at that time. That period also saw a big upsurge of the centrist left wing in the Socialist Party and a more and more radical position taken by the Young People's Socialist League. In all workers' organizations, there was ferment and change. One who had a political eye could see that things were really happening now and that this was not the time to be sitting in the library mulling over principles. This was the time for action on these principles. This was the time to be right on top of things, to take advantage of every opportunity presented by the new developments in the other organisations and movements. I must say that not a single one of them got away from us. We didn't wait for any invitation. We approached them. We issued a manifest on the front page of the militant calling for the formation of a new party and a new international. We invited all groupings, whoever they might be, who were interested in forming a new revolutionary party and a new inter international to discuss with us the basis of the program. We said, we have a program, but it is not presented to you as an ultimatum. It is our contribution to the discussion. If you have other ideas for the program, let's put them all on the table and discuss them in peaceful and comradely fashion. 
Let's try to resolve the differences on the program and join forces to build a new united party. We campaigned for the new party. Our great advantage over the other groups, the advantage which assured our hegemony, was that we knew what we wanted. We had a clearly defined program and that gave us a certain aggressive aggressiveness. The other left elements were not sure enough of themselves to take the initiative. That fell to us. We were beating the drums every week. In fact, all the time for a new party, writing letters to these people, writing critical but sympathetic reviews of their press and all their resolutions. Our rank and file comrades were instructed and drilled to establish connections with the rank and file members of these other groups to interest them in the discussion from all sides and top and bottom and thus prepare the way for the confusing <laughs> and thus prepare the way for the coming fusion of the serious and honest revolutionary elements in a single party. Meantime, our own organization was growing, attracting more attention and gaining more sympathy and respect. In all these radical circles, there was respect for Trotskyists as the honest communists and for Trotsky as the great Marxist thinker who had understood the German events when no one else did. We were admired for the way we had stuck to our guns and stood our ground despite persecution and adversity. Our organization was respected throughout the labor movement. This was important capital for us when the time came to promote the fusion of the various left groupings into one party. After five years of struggle, our ranks had become consolidated on a firm programmatic foundation. They'd been educated in the great principled questions, had acquired facility in explaining them and in applying them to the events of the day. We were ready, prepared by our past experience. In, in many respects, that experience had been somewhat dismal and negative to be sure, but it was precisely that period of isolation, hardship, discussion, study and assimilation of theoretical ideas that prepared our young movement for this new time of bloom when the movement was opening up in all directions. When we were ready for a very sharp tactical, then we were ready for a very sharp tactical turn. Our ranks were infused in those days with new hopes and with, with great high ambitions. By the end of 1933, we felt confident that we were on the way to the reconstitution of a genuine communist party in this country. We were sure that the future belonged to us. A lot of struggles were yet ahead of us, but we felt that we were over the hill, that we were on our way. History has proved that we were right in those assumptions. Thereafter, things moved very rapidly and continually in our favor. Our progress from that time on has been practically uninterrupted.